Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Blake Schaefer, Assistant Professor at the School of Public Policy and Department of Economics here at the University of Calgary. And welcome to the school's webinar series on important policy issues of our time. Uh, today's topic is no exception. We're gonna be talking about the um, very timely, very important topic of or orphan wells and more broadly, uh, end of life oil and gas well liabilities. I'm very pleased to have uh, two experts in this area join me today. So in the top left, I've got Keely Cameron. She is a lawyer at Bennett Jones and former regulatory lawyer at the AER. Hi, Keely. Hi. And in my bottom left, I have uh, Lucia Mullenbach, colleague of mine in the Department of Economics, uh, a top published scholar in the field of energy economics. And she's done extensive research in areas of, of methane leakage and regulation, as well as uh, orphaned and inactive wells. So thank you, Lucia. So if this is your first time joining the webinar, uh, just a few uh, housekeeping items or tidbits how this is going to work. At the bottom of your screen. Uh, click that at, and you can ask questions as we go through the session and I will do my best. I have the Q and a screen open. I will do my best to, to find your questions as we go and intersperse them into the conversation. I, I find it does work best. The more dialogue we get from participants, the more interaction. We may be losing him in and out here, so we're going to get him to try and call in on the phone. Oh, you've lost me? Yeah, twice now. Oh, you hear me now? Yep. Okay. It said unstable for a moment, but I think it's back. This is the problem with having three school age kids doing Zoom homeschooling. The internet gets taxed. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd start with the scope of the problem and then get into the details on the announced federal dollars coming towards uh, this problem and um, try to dive into that a little bit, but really spend our time on future policy prescriptions. Where do we need to go to, to limit the scope of this problem? Uh, so let's start with that first aspect. And I'll, I'll go to you, Lucia. Do, do, we have, do we have a good grasp on the scale of this problem? It, you, we hear lots of different numbers. Um, <laughs> in terms of how big this is and, and it, what's our best estimate or, or what does that look like? Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of numbers out there on the reclamation costs, like that are the costs to remediate the damages. And so I would first say that there's two types of costs we should think about. We should think about the costs of cleanup, but then we should also think about the costs of, of the ongoing damages that the inactive wells are causing. But for the cost of cleanup, so the AR has a public estimate of like $18 billion, but the, the Alberta Liabilities Disclosure Project FOIAed some numbers that of oil field service companies putting out uh, estimates for reclamation and abandonment and taking the oil, oil um, the, the Orphan Well Association's numbers, and they came up with a number of between 40 and 70 billion. I think Blake, you've also done work trying to calculate the the costs of the total the total cleanup. I think the big the big difference in in the public estimates on uh, and and what what private companies have have reported and and what Orphan Well Association comes up with is in the reclamation costs. So so the I think the AER predicts that it costs twenty eight thousand dollars to reclaim a well, but then um, the L ALDP comes up with a number of that can go up to two hundred thousand dollars to clean, to reclaim a well, whereas okay. the plugging is like fifty k. Okay, and when, when you're talking about this, we are we're restricting this conversation. You're talking about kind of conventional. I guess nowadays we call them unconventional, but not oil sands. Right, exactly. Those, yeah, that would be much more. But yeah, so just and that's what the 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 federal funding is for is for these oil and gas wells. And so I think, but then I think it's important to talk about the other types of costs that we have even less of a handle on. So I'd say yes, we have very little handle on the 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 engineering costs to clean up, but we have even less on on what is the ongoing damage of an inactive well. And that's a really important number to know for for understanding what we should be spending in policies and or to design a 
a good policy. And so you can imagine there's opportunity cost of the land that a farmer is not being able to use their land. And we have estimates of what the lease payments are from what the company would pay a farmer, but you could argue that's not actually the willingness to pay for for having a well on your land because there's no op option to say no. And, but then okay. there's there's perhaps risk to groundwater if if the well bore um, results in in maybe heavy metals or salts or, or methane entering groundwater formations. But then the cost of that really depends on who's drinking the groundwater, who's using the groundwater. And so these are things we really have really really little little knowledge about. And so putting a price tag on on these ongoing damages is super important, but such little work out there. Yeah, well, they always say to, to solve a problem, you need to know <laughs> the underlying problem, the, the size of it. So yeah, ALDP has done Yeoman's work in trying to get at that and trying to get it in the public realm. So I, I agree that's needed. You mentioned these different risks, sort of not just the, the abandonment, the plugging, as well as the reclamation, but this environmental risks, uh, high, um, water risks, uh, as well as other opportunity costs. I know Keely and I have talked in the past, and one of the things that's come up is this idea of, of risk weighting our cleanup efforts or risk targeting um so we, we're gonna have there's, there's a, whatever the number is it's in the billions and uh, it's going to be a challenge in terms of cleanup so focusing those cleanup efforts on ones that impose either the highest environmental risk or have the highest opportunity cost of, of sitting there um is something when we get to recommendations um, absolutely, absolutely yeah so that you know get, basically getting the best bang for our cleanup bucks yeah. Yeah. Um, Keely, you worked around the Redwater case. I wanted to talk a little bit about how these liabilities uh, either sit on company books or are perceived by lenders. And I, I'm kind of drawing parallels to the climate policy work that I'm, I'm a bit more involved in where we're seeing there's government action, but significant efforts, drivers of change are coming from the financial sector. So lenders being unwilling or investors being unwilling to go to places that they perceive having large climate risk liabilities and stranded asset risk. Are, is that something we're seeing in terms of investment and lending in the oil and gas space? Sure. So in terms of companies, companies in their financial statements will record these liabilities under their asset retirement obligations. And while there's an obligation to report those um, those amounts, there's no clear accounting principles that set out how you are to evaluate uh, those liabilities. Prior to Redwater, I would say lenders were less focused on what those amounts are, but there's greater focus now since the Redwater decision in terms of what those liabilities are. But I would say that lenders continue to be more focused on what the Alberta energy regulators liability assessment ratios are because it's those liability management ratios that will impact the ability of a company to transfer assets and the amount of security that may be required to be posted. Okay. okay. Um, maybe when we get into the policy prescriptions, I want to come back to those ratios and what they mean in terms of transfers. Um, I am just seeing a couple questions come in, and it's, it's good timing because I wanted to move into the, the announcement that the feds are spending one point, or they call them investing, but putting $1.7 billion uh, towards this, this problem, of which I believe $1.2 billion is headed to Alberta. Um, and I think $200 million of that is, is going directly to the Orphan Well Association, as, and $1 billion is going towards inactive wells that now the, our provincial government has announced the program. Um, to disperse that. So, you know, many people reacted to this in terms of, is this a slippery slope away from the polluter pay principle now that we have federal dollars coming in? Um, so Jim here asks, sh shouldn't the people who share in the benefits of oil and gas development also share in the cost of decommissioning and rehabilitating sites? Seems to me that the royalty and related systems fail to take this into account. So, is there scope for securitizing um, perhaps the, the decommissioning costs through the royalty system? I, I wonder if that's what um, Jim is getting at. Either of you want to look, take that? Sure. Uh, well, I think one of the 
feedbacks or comments I've seen in respect of the government, federal government's program right now is that given the federal benefit of Alberta's resource development, it's on that basis that the federal government should be contributing funds to help address some of these issues. So I think that's part of one of the arguments, at least in support of the government's current program is actually ensuring that some of the funds that have flown, flown out of Alberta are brought back in um, through this program and through trying to create jobs. In terms of the number of jobs that will be created, I think that still remains to be seen, especially given, as we talked about earlier, the need to prioritize sites based on risk while the current federal program is currently um, focusing on getting the most number of sites addressed through focusing on low cost, low risk sites, rather than those high, high impact, high environmental sensitive sites. Yeah, we, we talked about that the other day a little bit. I wanted to expand on it. So, you know, my understanding of the provincial program, which is dispersing the, the $1 billion is, is there's a $30,000 cap. Is that, is that correct? Sort of per well? Correct. So yeah. under the first uh, $100 million that's been released, it's limited to projects where the scope of work is limited to $30,000 for completion of the project. Okay. So that doesn't leave, you know, there's, it's not going to be too many wells that get um, plugged and reclaimed for, for that sort of dollar. So are we just cleaning up kind of the easy to clean ups and kind of Shifting, or shifting the dollars away from perhaps the ones we talked about earlier, or the ones with the higher environmental risks, perhaps higher dollar cost of cleanup. Is it gonna that seems to be the suggestion and interesting in this economic um, circumstances is whether or not this will actually impact and change the amount of liability associated with these sites if the government's able to demonstrate that contractors will carry out the work for 30,000 in order to get those contracts. Okay. Um, Maureen McLeod, there's lots of questions coming in. So if you see me shifting back, I'll do my best. She has a question kind of related to this. So if we summarized it, we can move on. But um, I heard that this could be a wonderful and ongoing make work project and a partial answer to unemployment in Alberta. How would this work and who would pay? Uh, so does someone want to, um, I guess, recap if, if, I have, if we haven't already answered Maureen's question on who's paying for this? So you summarize what, so I think, so it's coming from the federal government to Alberta and, and going to oil field service companies to then, they put in the applications. I think there's a list of 90,000 inactive wells that they can choose from and then put in an application for $30,000 worth of work and then we'll get reimbursed for that and uh, so wages would get reimbursed and so I, the dream is that this is allowing for new em employment of people who would otherwise not be employed and that's okay. that so we have a clarification coming in from Peter the 30,000 limit is per project and per site you are allowed more than one project per site ie a phase one phase two and phase three at least that was what was presented by Alberta Energy I don't know if that means in future rounds or whatnot, or or how that could get clear. Um, but uh, you know, this is a, a brand new rollout of a program, so there's going to be these clarifications required. So thank you, Peter. Um, Henry asked another one related to this. Please explain more about how the program will work. Such as, is the money a loan or a grant, and which companies can access this money? That's a great question. Either of you have that? I, I think Lucia already touched on this. So it is a grant and it's provided to the oil field service companies for work um, that's approved through the grant project. So what it, what's required is the service company needs to enter into an unconditional agreement with a licensee to carry out work in respect of in, in one or more inactive sites. And then they can submit that agreement as part of their grant approval requests and the government will come back and if they're approved they can get paid up to thirty thousand dollars in this first round per project and my understanding is that these dollars are up to a hundred percent forgivable so this is not a not a loan 
um, this is money coming from the federal taxpayer directly to the oil service companies, correct? Correct. Okay. So this, you know, maybe this is the big picture question that lots of people just sort of approaching this would ask. So Graham asks, how did we reach this point where the taxpayer is going to foot the bill for the cleanup costs as opposed to the companies which drilled and completed the wells? Lucia, do you want to start with that? How, you know, that, is, that is a fair question. How did we get to that? So I think it, I think it's, I kind of wish the, there was this, this liability, like licensee liability rating program that was implemented in the early 2000s with the, which wasn't really that forward thinking and that, so right now if the company goes bankrupt, the, the industry as a whole will divide up the costs of that cleanup and then pay for it as the industry. So it's technically it doesn't go back to uh, non oil and gas people but but the 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 thing with that with that with saying okay we're going to clean up our own mess you could imagine what's going to happen if we fast forward and when there's more and more companies that go bankrupt and and then this this orphan well association that divides up the cost of cleanup has fewer and fewer companies to divide the cleanup costs up across and so then these orphan well liabilities can become bigger and bigger and and so I think it, it's a function of, of not having forced a, a financial assurance up front from upon drilling a well that that really you don't have to post a bond to drill a well in Alberta if you have assets that are deemed greater than your liabilities and these assets are calculated using perhaps outdated um, numbers and this liabilities also. And so, so we, you end up having, you know, wells that don't have any financial assurance associated with them. And then if they go bankrupt, they go into this orphan well association. And right now, big companies are complaining about this three th paying for, for these orphan wells when there's only 3,000 or a little bit over 3,400 in, in, in the Orphan Well Association, but you can imagine with 90,000 inactive wells, that's just a drop in the bucket. So yeah, we're in this, yeah, I, I, great answer. I, the history here is, as you said, sort of the deal was struck that this would be a collective insurance coverage in effect. If individual companies go under, the rest of the industry pools together and then takes care of the fallen, if you will. Um, that works nicely when you have one or two or half a dozen companies going under uh, per year. But when you have a systemic downturn in the entire industry, clearly collective self-insurance doesn't work anymore. Um, and that's where we're at today. Um, Nikki asks a very good question, which is, what are your thoughts on how can this first program be leveraged to deal with the bigger issue? One billion dollars can only go so far. Can this be designed to go farther and address more liabilities? Um, Keely, any, any thoughts there for how we leverage yeah, so, this billion? So, so I think one of the shortcomings or maybe Hope, hopefully future changes that will come along with this program is, first of all, expanding the amount of funds available per project. So we aren't just targeting these smaller environmental liability projects. But additionally, I, I think there also needs to go along with it some regulatory or policy changes to actually impose requirements and timelines for cleaning up certain sites in certain situations. I know British Columbia has started moving in that direction and other jurisdictions are looking at going there as well because one of the challenges we have right now, especially in this downturn, is when you have a licensee who doesn't have an actual requirement to carry out closure work at this time and they have limited liquidity, it becomes really challenging for them to move forward even with a grant where there's still some cost to that company in terms of going forward. Whereas if we actually had firm requirements requiring this work to be carry out, carried out, there'd be a greater incentive. I think also, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later, I think it'd be helpful if there were also some grants or other incentives provided through this program to help actually repurpose some of these wells or some of these sites, whether it can be done for producing other minerals, whether it's lithium, hydrogen, helium, as well as also, I know there's started to be greater pushes for converting some of these sites for solar. 
use, which in the grand scheme of things might not be super economic, but be a way to address and limit some of these liabilities. Well, that, that's a great answer. Yeah, some of the fears and sort of the rush to disperse this billion dollars um, is that we may not prioritize um, we may not prioritize them in terms of where they go and, and leave things on the table, like you say, repurpose options for, for other minerals that might, uh, in effect, reduce the cost of cleanup because you can use the site for some other reason. Uh, related to this, Re Regan has a, a good question here. Um, Alberta's site rehabilitation program does not prioritize well as cleanup decisions remain with the licensee. Would like to hear policy ideas for how these inactive wells should be prioritized and what that process should look like. So my understanding is at wells that go into the orphan well fund, so not the inactive ones we're talking about there, but in the orphan well fund, the orphan well association does do some prioritization. I'm not sure how it's exactly done. Uh, someone listening probably knows well, but um, they do some sort of prioritization. This larger cleanup program doesn't have that. So any thoughts on, on how we could affect um, you know, disperse the billion in an orderly fashion that maximizes its value? This is where we kind of have this key missing number of what are the ongoing damages from inactive wells. And if we knew, okay, if deeper wells were the ones that had more methane emissions, or if we knew older wells had more or less, you know, contaminated soil or something, there's something to guide us for prioritizing to the, the most, the most, the ones with the most ongoing damages, then I'd say that would be useful. So I don't know, but absolutely for smart policy, you want, you can't, right now it's this first come first serve, but you know, ideally you'd want it to go to the ones that are causing the most damage. Okay. Um, I, I've got more questions than I can even view on my screen. So this is, this is challenging, but um, Lori, I just going to clarify her question. Uh, does the federal grant money go only to orphan wells where the owner has declared bankruptcy? So uh, my understanding is no, 200 million of the 1.2 is going directly to the orphan well fund. Uh, that was at least in the, in the press or a repayable loan to the orphan well association. Uh, the 1 billion though is, uh, is, is the one that's being dispersed by the provincial program and that is going to inactive wells. So wells is still a viable owner. Um, I think, you know, I've got, we can probably move this into the next series of questions that are related to this. I'm trying hard to view what's in here, but I want to talk about what needs to be done. So when the feds announced this money coming to the provinces, the strings attached were you'll get these dollars. It'll help with employment and it'll help uh, with these remediations that have environmental benefits, but the sort of strings attached were that, you'll tighten up your regulations so that this problem doesn't keep increasing. When asked about that, the energy minister sort of, in effect, delayed any actionable response. Um, no doubt there's talk going on at Alberta Energy right now and has been in terms of what to do, but there's been no messaging, public messaging yet to date in terms of what are they going to do to reform the series of programs we have. So, that's where I wanted to turn the conversation because I think it's the most important one, which is what policies do we need? And I thought for, for ease of organization, we can think about this in terms of um, dealing with existing wells, dealing with new wells, and dealing with transfers of well licenses. So selling off packages. Um, you know, it's often, we often get this pushback when there's any discussion of reform of the policies that now is not the time uh, in the good times, it's not the time because there's really no problem. Uh, and in the bad times, it's not the time because any additional costs will simply tip what I'll call zombie companies into bankruptcy. Um, so it seems now, you know, never is the time for reform, which, which I argue can't be the answer. Uh, perhaps we can think about these in different ways. Can we deal with some aspects of these uh, in terms of reform? So, what, so maybe you'll start with Lucia. What, what would you see as sort of major reforms or what would you target if you, if you could um, have a, a conversation with the energy minister? Just, uh, exist, so existing wells, I think a lot of the pushback, like you say, is that the fear that there's a lot of companies that would go under if, if, if there was any stricter liability rules put in place. But if the AER publishes numbers on the number of companies that, uh, you know, the, how, how much liability each 
the number of companies that fall in these these different liability ranges depending on their assets to liabilities and when you look at the numbers that for on first glance it is glance it's really scary it seems like 700 licensees and over 50 percent are have assets that are lower than liabilities according to their and as I said, the assets might be overinflated, and so you could imagine much more than 50% of licensees in Alberta are underwater. And then you think, okay, clearly we can't we can't put more pressure on them. But if you look at the amount of liability that this 50% of companies hold, they're holding only 7% of the liability in Alberta. And so there's there's room. We still have, you know, if you know the more solvent companies are the ones holding most of the liability, then I think we you know, there's, there is a little bit more room to, to help change in policy. And, and then, then what would those changes look like? Yeah, then it's nice to think, break out them out through existing wells and new wells. And so for existing wells, maybe you want to be a little less harsh and maybe increase like bonding schemes or put simply a price on making uh, inactive wells more expensive. Right now, the policy of, of making abandonment cheaper what that would do is result in fewer active and inactive wells. But if you if you make it more expensive to leave a well inactive, and ideally at the cost of the, of the ongoing damages, that would be the optimal tax in according to theoretical, you know, the theory economic theory, then 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 we would see more more abandonments and more activations of wells. And so I would say, yeah, that's maybe even more effective than time limits uh, because it can also just lead for flexibility. So just putting, making it more expensive for inactive wells, having bonds, and and then for new wells, I think you can be more aggressive because we have far fewer wells being drilled, but these are really deep and long laterals. And, and so I think there's a little bit more, they produce much more upfront and so they're productive. And and so I think, um, the, yeah, these decline curves are pretty striking. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. More so aggressive. You, you talked a bit about the optimal bonding, which would uh, you know increase the securitization as the well moves towards inactivity. Um, when there's basically the, the positive value has been eroded and you're left with negative value and assuming the company has a portfolio, that makes more sense. Um, this issue of timelines, I just wanna to touch on that before I turn to you, Keely. It's often brought up. It seems, you know, Alberta is one of the few jurisdictions left that does not have uh, a timeline for full reclamation. There's some timelines around the inactivity, the suspension process, but um, no timeline um, um, for, for cleanup. And the, the argument typically goes that that's too rigid, it's too blunt, and it negates the possibility of a firm going back into a dormant well later on and, and extracting value as prices or technology change. I, I know you've done some work on this, so I um, just wanted to see if, you know, what you've seen in your work in terms of the probabilities that firms really do go back into inactive wells. So yeah, the, my dissertation on the probability of reactivating inactive wells, and they're really very, very unlikely to be reactivated, like less than, yeah, the vast majority will never be reactivated, and even 95% of wells will, that are, you know, over 20 years old won't and inactive they're just not going to be reacted or according to the, the 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 historical data that i was using but the yeah but then i think a timeline is kind of would be classified as one of these command and control approaches where you're telling everybody to do the exact same thing which would be less flexible than just making it more expensive to leave a well inactive yeah i mean the, the benefit is simplicity the worry has always been truncating the life of what could be a valuable well but yeah but then that they're probably not going to get reactivated but with that said if ex exactly your your research has sort of shown me that maybe this is more of a talking point than something that the data actually supports there, there are firms out there that focus on this. So there'll be many people with their hands raised saying we go back into more wells, so that's their core focus. But, but for many, that's really not reality. Yeah, so in simulations are using the model that I wrote, it really, if, the, if you just put a price on inactive wells, they can get reactivated. Whereas if you just make it cheaper to abandon, then they're just going to become abandoned. So okay. maybe it, I think my push would be just making it more expensive. To so this relates to Blair's got a question here. Do you foresee Alberta moving towards a regulatory regime that prevents corporations offloading environmental liabilities, like in the BC Environmental Management Act, and that requires viable companies reclaim dormant and inactive wells, like the BC dormancy and shutdown? Regulation. Blair is clearly from BC, and uh, props to some BC policies. Ke Keely, do you want to touch on this? Um, you know, this issue of downloading liabilities and and uh, 
requiring dormant and inactive wells to be reclaimed, so effectively a time limit? Yeah, so, so I think there certainly needs to be a better trigger in terms of when sites need to be abandoned and reclaimed, but it, a one-size-fits-all is not going to work in these situations. As I mentioned, there may be other mineral uses that could be used for these sites. I think the key trigger and key focus needs to be in we need to get smarter in terms of ensuring that our regulatory system isn't requiring companies to needlessly spend money on things. So ensuring that our reclamation remediation requirements are fit for purpose so that we can ensure that the funds companies do have can be used in the most efficient and effective means. For that as well, under current regulatory requirements, some companies end up producing uneconomic sites in order to maintain their liability management ratio and keep from triggering inactive well sites. So I think that's another area where there needs to be a discussion in terms of whether that really makes sense. Similarly, um, I've always been a big proponent we should collect some security throughout the life cycle of a uh, well's productive life, but at the same time, does it make sense to have those funds sitting in account, maybe not even generating any interest, when we could actually be taking those funds that are currently held by the regulator and putting it to work to address some of these issues and address those liabilities? So while I think what BC's done is better than not having requirements, I think there's still a number of options that could be explored to find out what, what process will result in the greatest number of sites being cleaned up. Um, should there be a requirement to clean them up? I know BC's also, um, through a recent Auditor General report, raised the issue of are there some sites where it just does not make sense from a public policy economics standpoint to actually abandon and reclaim those sites? Mm -hmm. And I think if we start having that type of dialogue again, it changes the conversation and allows us to refocus on what those priorities should be. Yeah, it kind of comes back to that earlier thing about prioritizing which ones get cleaned up. On this issue of offloading liabilities, I mean, um, the Globe and Mail did a big expose on this. It's a sort of often something that's brought up is you know, viable or semi-viable companies uh, selling well licenses, packages of them to um, less viable companies that ultimately, in, in some cases, not very long after, uh, go bankrupt and, and leave behind this swath. So we, we've seen instances of this over the past five years. Um, really, you know, headline forming numbers of these companies going bankrupt and leaving behind um, these problems. So one of the moves that the um, AER did in the past few years when they looked at these reforming, um, reforming policy was increase that asset to liability ratio from one to two in order to receive, uh, receive uh, licenses. So basically, your deemed assets needed to be double your deemed liabilities, not including financial liabilities, just physical in order to receive um, uh, well licenses. But even since then, we've seen packages transfer that with the company receiving company go bankrupt subsequently. So I, I, I wanna focus on these trans, this issue of transfers. Uh, on two, two questions. One, is the LMR ratio just broken? Is it, is it not giving us the right signal in terms of the viability of the company? That's one, and then the other is, some transfers, and I see a couple questions here about gas processing plants reaching end of life, and we know that some of the old sour gas processing plants are some of the biggest liabilities outside the oil sands. When transfers involve those, you know, bigger ones, or even more broadly, do we need to think about selling companies retaining some of the liability for a certain period of time? Um, Keely, you want to start and then Lucia? Sure. So, so I think actually the starting point is the rate the LMR was not intended to assess a company's um, solvency, right? It doesn't look at cash flows. It doesn't look at other aspects of a company's assets or liabilities. It was really intended as a very simple calculation for, for the government and the regulator to look and determine 
when you're when a company's assets were reaching that level of maturity and the main focus was to ensure you're always either drilling more wells to keep up that production and keep on going or addressing some of those liabilities in terms of transfers there are existing regulatory requirements um, under the environmental protection and enhancement act there's the ability to go back and look at previous owners of a site to hold them responsible for liabilities under insolvency legislation there's also the ability to do some look backs so there's certainly some of those requirements already out there additionally what i've started seeing in my practice is a growing trend of companies providing environmental trusts that travel along with the assets okay. to try to ensure that those liabilities do get addressed. But I do think there certainly is some challenges that have been created with the previous approach where you could have a site that's been producing for 30, 50 years and all of a sudden it gets transferred to a brand new company and that company is expected to take on 100% of the liability, even though it didn't get all that previous production to contribute towards addressing it. Okay, so why have we, if we have the ability to go back, uh, you know, up, up, the, up the chain to, to recover these environmental damages, why have we not seen that occur uh, in some of these defaults? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can answer as to why that hasn't been used. I think the greater focus over time has been through utilizing Northern Well Association, and that's maybe perhaps an easier process than potentially pursuing those previous owners. Okay. I just want to, before I jump to you, Lucia, a couple of questions actually for you, Keely. Um, this one's from Regan. Do, does the AER have the authority or could it be directed to spend the 200 million sitting in LLR deposits uh, instead of those deposits sitting idle? So effectively, you know, could direct them into the OWA in a short-term basis or something, go towards cleanup. Um, and the other is, does the AER have the authority to determine the solvency of licensees? So not, as you said, the LMR being a calculation for a different purpose, but actually to try to do a calculation that the investment community would look at, or, or do we have to wait for lenders to foreclose to, to learn of that? Sure. Um, in, in terms of the first question, there are provisions under the Alberta Energy Regulators legislation that does enable them where a company has failed to comply with the requirements for which the security was held, they can use those funds to carry out that work. So there would potentially be the ability of the regulator under their current regime to use some of those funds for that purpose. In terms of assessment of insolvency, could, could the regulator be given that authority? I think, sure, why not? You could put those provisions, but I think the issue is whether or not you want them um, and whether they're appropriately suited to carry out that function. And even if they could assess um, the insolvency of a company, for what purpose would you be looking to have the regulator step in and actually put companies into bankruptcy? Right. So I'm not sure, it's certainly a policy at avenue that could be pursued, but I'm not sure it's necessarily um, the best use. If you just look at your own personal finances and solvency, whether or not your solvent could vary on any given day right and so it's really what you decide to do about that and then there also creates a potential conflicts if you start having your regulator um, take steps that impact the ability of a company to continue as a going concern and enter into deals with other lenders to address any solvency issues that they may have right I, i'll i'll moderator privilege plugged one of my earlier works a paper at the cd how we really we were focused on policy prescriptions and one of our suggestions was an insurance requirement on inactive wells and the idea there was this incentive compatibility of not having the aer go and assess the financial viability of the company but you have third-party intermediaries that are effectively writing insurance so large reinsurance companies who are 
doing the calculation of what are the environmental liabilities uh, that I'm about to insure and what is the probability of this firm going bankrupt. And then you're getting the, those experts to, to write that. Um, so you're, you're trying to get expertise where you can. Uh, Lucia, I, I'm going to go to you. Then I got one last question. We'll wrap it up. But any thoughts on transfers, what we could do to, to ensure we aren't downloading? Yeah, I think that, I mean, you asked about the LM idea. So you need two times your asset deemed assets to be greater than your liabilities, but then there's exceptions to this rule. And so maybe just making, yeah, make, yeah, some, yeah, this transfer. I think what's interesting is, okay, if we know that this, this asset rate should have, should have been updated, like, 10 years ago and and it hasn't been and so assets are overinflated it's what's interesting is that it's really the big companies that are getting nervous about this that they're the ones that are going to suffer when these wells go to the orphan well association and so it's in the best interest of you know the big players the big oil and gas companies who are, might be left holding the bag when there's transfers that happen and the companies go bankrupt um that they they would have the incentive to make change and it's true those are kind of the loud the loud uh uh, the squeaky yeah. wheels that went yeah in in complaining about these these the, the LMR not doing a good job. Okay. Allowing. Um, so last question, something we didn't really touch on, but I think it's a really important question from Dwight here. What do land what do landowners with wells that are in limbo do? How do they get into the queue if the operator is insolvent but the AER has not declared the well an orphan? Uh, can a landowner get a service company to do both abandonment and reclamation? So are there situations that fall through the cracks like that? The uh, wells haven't been transferred to the OWA for cleanup or uh, issue from a surface rights owner? Heartbreaking. Yeah, I don't I know. I... So, so I, I can comment on this. If there's sites or, or a company has gone to insolvency proceedings, um, typically what happens is those assets um, fall under the receiver during the process and the receiver has the ability to sell the assets or take other steps in relation to them. So in those circumstances, it wouldn't really be open without the receiver or trustees consent for a third party to go on and take steps to carry out abandonment or reclamation work. And I think one of the other things to keep in mind is there is potential liability for anyone going on a site to carry out that closure work. So it's not necessarily open, um, even for someone with the best of intentions to just go on to a landowner's land or even for the landowner to go on to that surface lease to carry out that type of work. Okay. Well, we are at time, so I'm gonna wrap it up. We got through, I think, 15 questions and we had 45. So I did my best. Uh, it means it's a really important topic to a lot of folks. And I think we just scratched the surface and there'll be many more conversations to be had. This is still a developing policy area, big implications for Alberta going forward. Um, I want to thank Keely and Lucia for your time today. Thanks for joining us. And a reminder to all of you, uh, the School of Public Policy is doing these webinars. They're trying to do twice a week on lots of different interesting topics. And you can register for upcoming webinars at www.policyschool.ca webinars. So go check it out. And thank you very much.